Hello, hi, thank you very much for allowing me to talk on complex pilon fractures. My name is Lyndon Mason. I am a surgeon of the foot and ankle and a major trauma surgeon, and I currently work in Liverpool. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, especially Ben Fisher, who has uh, shouldered the burden of pilon fractures with me over the last five years. And since we merged hospitals, the Limerick Con team have also done such. Uh, I've been tasked with uh, trying to give a flavor of the complex pilons, and over the next 10 minutes, I'll try and go through these subjects. So first of all, classifications. So in the late 1970s, Rudy Algawa's classification of pilon fractures was really the good, the bad, and the ugly. My, uh, my trainer, Claire Topless, uh, I trained under her, she's now in Swansea, uh, she then described uh, further six typical fragments of the pilon fractures, which were the anterior, posterior, medial, anterolateral, postrolateral, and the dye punch fragments. It, not all pilons have each one of these fragments, but these are the typical fragments you'll find in pilon fractures. They also found that there are three main groups of fractures based on the orientation of the fracture lines, where you had the coronal group, which are typically lower energy fractures on the top row there, the sagittal group, which are typically the higher energy fractures in the younger patients, and then the comminuted fractures of such severity that you couldn't really assign it to each group. They also noted a separate group of fractures where you had a intact fibula incongruity of the joint between the lateral malleolus and the lateral tailor facet. And they recognized that these did very badly if this was not recognized. Moving on, the uh, 2018 compendium from the OTA and the OR Foundation uh, recognized that you could really split these into partial articulars, where you had a uh, typical chrome sagittal and fragmentary as were the uh, clear topless classifications. Uh, but then you had the impaction fragments, which are your 43 Bs, and then your 43 Cs were your complete articular uh, fractures, and these uh, went up in severity uh, depending on the metaphyseal uh, combination. The mercy treatment of pilon fractures is number one soft tissue. It's always soft tissue, and soft tissue is the biggest concern. And also, the valgus and central injuries do bad. Uh, having a metaphysis is good. So, anything which you have metaphyseal loss, you're looking at a bigger. Um, amounts of metal work to stabilize, and then you have decreasing size of article fragments is also uh, bad because the bigger fragments, the easier they are to fix. In the emergency treatment on this side of the pond, uh, the ATLS protocol, um, pilon fractures are often associated with other injuries, and therefore it's important to treat the patient first before the limb. Uh, pain control, assess the neurovascular status, then you wound uh, skin problems, stage soft tissues. Uh, again, on uh, this side of the water, uh, the British Orthopedic Association and Bathurst guidelines do guide our treatment of open fractures. You've also got to treat any associated injuries and get a radiograph. Sorry. We've got soft tissue assessment required. Is there open or closed features, swelling, blistering, and this will then dictate your timing of treatment. This is the main uh, way of treatment of uh, span, scan, and plan. It's not for all pilon fractures, but the high uh, high velocity injuries, certainly this is the best way. This came from the paper by Sirkin, um, which uh, in group one, where they looked at the closed pilon injuries, if they underwent immediate or if the fibula and X fix, uh, they noted that they didn't have any full thickness skin necrosis and then required secondary soft tissue coverage. Uh, this was a game changer, really, because uh, this then went on the line that we should be doing two-stage treatment for the high velocity pilon injuries. And this is the typical uh, external fixator. Uh, you want the, uh, your pins outside the zone of injury. That's the typical A-frame. The quad frames are also used. The way I trained uh, under Ian Pallister, uh, the quad frame was the um, main uh, X-fix that we uh, instilled in these uh, uh, in pilon fractures. In regards to surgical reconstruction approaches, so the principles of definitive management really are, uh, for the bony side, you want articular reconstruction, connect that articular block to the metaphysis, adequate metal work to stabilize this and then mobilize as quickly as possible. Uh, soft tissue is all about the timing, uh, using minimal dissection of fascia cutaneous uh, uh, windows. This is a great paper and I highly uh, suggest those treating pilons to go through this. Uh, this one, Cronier and Stefan Rommel. I worked uh, under uh, Stefan in Dresden for a uh, traveling fellowship. Uh, classical steps uh, is reconstruct the fibula, reconstruct the tibial articular surface, uh, bone graft, and then plating. 
In regards to die punch fragments, uh, if you open up the fracture plane that allows you a window into where the die punches are, you can see uh, here we got fragments that we can access through this window. And then when we uh, reconstruct and replace where uh, the die punch should be, uh, close the book and stabilize as such. It's also important to note where your constant fragment is. Uh, it's usually around the lateral or postrolateral uh, connected to the fibula. Uh, in this diagram, you see the postrolateral fragment is where the constant fragment here, and this is where you're attaching everything to. And that, that's why uh, fixing the fibula out to length can uh, really aid uh, this uh, as it uh, controls your constant fragment. Your approaches, uh, first of all, you can have small windows. Uh, the small windows is what I usually do in my management. Uh, small windows, uh, and there's a number of approaches around the ankle and being confident around the ankle would allow you the lateral approach, your uh, anterior approach, your medial approach, postural medial, your postural lateral, direct lateral. Uh, any window can be uh, maintained. But in regards to this paper, uh, they looked at as long as you stay uh, around about five to six centimeters apart on the incisions, 5.7 is what they uh, deemed uh, the lowest amount uh, acceptable. If you uh, achieve this, then you would not get wound problems. Uh, you would, uh, it's important to have a CT scan. The CT scan is then uh, dictating how you're going to approach the, the fracture. Uh, what you want to do is get access through the window and also get access to what metalwork you want to do. In regards to the large windows, well, this is then on your angiosomes. So this paper back in 1998, a fantastic paper on the angiosomes of the lower limb. And the first one is this uh, very large uh, incision where you just stay lateral to your uh, tibial crest. And then at this point of the ankle, you come uh, medial uh, with a full thickness flap, a fascia containment window, allows you to also fix both the anterior and medial aspect of the tibia. My also uh, working window with the medial posture medial is very uh, useful, not only for posture malleolar fractures. As you can see here, I can access the back of the tibia with this uh, small window, but it's also extensile, so you can extend it up through your uh, medial fasciotomy line. Also, the medial posture medial and posture lateral approaches uh, have been studied together and found in no problems in regards to wound healing. A transfibular approach, this has been a game changer for me. So when you have them fragments on the lateral aspect that you can't usually access, the transfibular approach allows you to rotate the fibula out of the way and access these uh, lateral um, uh, dipunch fragments, or you can actually see any postural malleolar fractures. The uh, last one, which I uh, personally have not used myself, is the uh, using on the angiosome of your anterior tibial artery. You can, through this large dissection, lift off uh, your anterior compartment and access the tibia on the anterolateral aspect. In regards to outcomes, so first of all, the position of the ankle uh, does dictate uh, the outcomes. Uh, this paper showed this. Um, we, when they split them into group one, two, five, uh, the functional scores are significantly higher in the groups which uh, dictate your dorsiflexion or plantar flexion injuries. Groups uh, two and five, which are valgus and neutral, did worse. When attaching the epiphysis to the diaphysis, uh, there is a debate. So those that are your metaphysial loss, we're then debating whether or not the circular uh, external fixator or if are, um, have better results. So this uh, systematic review, which was done last year, five comparative studies, 239 fractures, significant higher rate of unplanned metalwork removal in ORF groups, um, but a lower rate of post-traumatic arthritis are found. However, three of the studies found comparable functional outcomes between the two treatment groups. Overall preference, however, in treating the more severe injuries with the circular frames. And this is from that paper. You can see that uh, on your uh, forest plots, that uh, there's slight favor in RF on the effective complications. Favors the RF on post-traumatic arthritis. And secondary pro uh, procedures favors your uh, circular frame. This is a paper uh, outside of this uh, study, the important inclusion study that's come from our unit. And when we looked at 76 ORIF and 59 circular frame, uh, treated again, circular frames were uh, used typically on those with open injuries or those that uh, had uh, more severe injuries, but it specifically uh, was on closed injury, this paper. Uh, but you can see there's no uh, difference significantly between the, um, uh, any of these factors. Uh, there's a, a current active uh, trial on uh, looking specifically at uh, the difference between circular frame and the randomized control uh, trial between ORIF, and we're currently inputting into this. 
So our methods, so the methods that we institute in our uh, department is really depend on the classification. So in, and we start off with the uh, B2s rather than the um, B1s where you have impaction fragments. So when you want to try to get these impaction fragments, what you want is that for your articular reconstruction, you need to see the joint, you need to connect the articular block to the metaphysis, um, but you don't need to do that for these because they're partial articular. They're adequate metal which stabilize them. We're looking at the compression across the joint and buttress plates. You don't need a bridge plate because you've got uh, metaphysis intact. Uh, swelling is usually minimal. It's going to use the uh, kind of these early and may not require any spanning. And your fascia catena windows uh, need windows for um, joint uh, network. So uh, this is a uh, posterior malleolar fracture, but as you can see, you've got this dive punch in the middle of it. Uh, our windows in are through your medial posture medial or through the fibula. Actually, it's from medial posture medial. Can't quite get significantly to this area. So I chose uh, to go uh, transfibular. Uh, you can see the osteostome has been placed over the fracture line and then it's been impacted into the line. So we need a window not only to get the um, osteotome in, but we need a window then to fix uh, posteriorly. When you have your uh, 43 C's, where you complete articulars, then you may need to see the joint um, if you do have a die punch. Uh, connect the articular block to the metaphysis, uh, so you need placing screws and really a frame. Uh, adequate metalwork uh, to stabilize the compression across the joint and um, buttress plates uh, because you do have an intact metaphysis that you're attaching it to. Uh, swelling is minimal, so you can usually uh, um, do these earlier. Again, need windows for the joint and metalwork. So this is a fracture, you can see the anterior pylon and a posterior pylon, and the posterior pylon goes up uh, very high. As your CT, it's got a very small amount of common use but no uh, um, achievable die punch. The medial posture medial is uh, the go-to as we can get uh, all the way up the back if required. Uh, this is done through two separate windows and then uh, another window anteriorly to fix the anterior pylon. Uh, this is a uh, complete rotational pylon. Uh, this was in a uh, young girl um, who had uh, reached uh, sleep maturity. Uh, as you can see, the institute should actually be sitting the fibula should be sitting in the interior here, and you can see this has got a central uh, tibia intact, and the rest of the tibia has rotated off it. So for these, we need to uh, bit by bit uh, attach these uh, to these bits of articular surface back to the central uh, tibia. So first of all, the interior was uh, corrected, and the posterior malleolus was uh, uh, achieved. And through small windows, then I have uh, gone around the ankle, attaching all the uh, other fragments back to the main tibial shaft. When you've got uh, this uh, metaphyseal loss, uh, this then when you're talking about uh, frames and uh, bridge plates. So for these, we need to see the joint because it'll be die punch fragments. You need to connect the articular block to metaphysis. You need strong fixation to bridge metaphysis. Uh, soft tissue, uh, this is when you definitely need a, uh, uh, some time to allow the swelling to proceed. And fascia cutaneous, you need windows uh, for both the joint and the network. So you can see here we have uh, significant comminution around the articular surface. Uh, it is a, this is a, a closed injury, but we do have uh, considerable comminution around uh, metaphysis also. And uh, this was in a frame for uh, quite a while, so the fibula was not actually uh, open at the time uh, due to the worry about the soft tissue. And uh, this was plated anteriorly uh, with the window to allow the dive punches to be uh, reduced and uh, fixation to occur. And this is the uh, post-op uh, scars at six months. He's now five years out, so it didn't require any further surgery. Uh, you can see the small windows that have been uh, done to get the metal in for this gentleman. Now, this is a, an open injury. Uh, so even though the articular fragments are uh, relatively straightforward and would usually be uh, platable, uh, due to the open injury, this went on for a frame. So it's a hybrid fixation attaching the two uh, fragments uh, back together, and then a frame has been placed. Uh, to attach uh, the metaphysical block to the tibia. Um, he's now five years down the line, again, didn't require any further surgery. When we have uh, this type of problem, where we have an open injury and significant bone loss. As you can see, the bone has been debrided and been removed uh, for concerns for infection, a hybrid fixation uh, of the articular block. And then for these, a frame is uh, required uh, to transport the bone. And Obviously, this uh, uh, bone transport is one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Fisher's. Okay, and that's where I'll end. Thank you very much.